I wanted to start off by asking about Hank. He, he says that we all have a little darkness in us. Yeah. And we see that in this film, don't we? Yeah. Can you tell us a little well, bit I, about that? I, um, I'm really drawn to uh, stories and characters and people that really address that element. Not, not macabre, not from a horror standpoint, but in it, nor do I think that everyone has a little darkness in them, but certainly everybody has some place in their heart or mind or some part of them that, they're, that shame or guilt. Not that they even deserve it to feel that way, but they feel that way about themselves. And I do think that the greatest singers, songwriters, uh, artists often portray a side of the human condition which is the more hidden side. And whether it's, you know, Lucian Freud or, or Francis Bacon or even Picasso's way of looking at things, to someone sort of seemingly, you know, is, is sort of simply put as Hank. I'm, fa I'm interested in that. And I think, look at all the great literature that is, comes from there. There's an honesty and a sincerity in Hank's writing, and I wondered whether yeah. you felt a duty to tell his story in the same spirit. That's exactly what I was hoping to do. I wanted to avoid the cliches. I didn't want to try to explain what a genius he was or why he was such a genius. I didn't want to try to show him as a little boy and psychoanalyze how he became Hank Williams. What I really wanted to do was actually say, hey, look at this life this guy was leading at the, at, in these six, seven years of his life, up to 29 years old. Look at the, the turmoil. Look at the pain. Look at, And then let the audience decide, oh, so... I can understand why he wrote what he wrote from some of the things that we see he experienced, which, by the way, are things that all of us experience. Everybody has, that has relationships, whether it's a man and a man or men and women or, or we all know people that drink too much and sometimes take too many drugs or have whatever, you know, things that they do. But in this case, he was able to turn it, spin it into this brilliant literature. And that's what the movie that I wanted to do, and I did want it to be by the numbers. So sometimes people really didn't, a lot of people, that bugged, to be honest with you. They wanted to see him as a young boy, and they wanted to see, you know, I, I never intended to. Neither did Tom ever want to do that. Tell that story. <clears throat> film is never, or very rarely, shot chronologically. But clearly, kind of in the third act of the film, we see yeah. the demise of Hank. And obviously, Tom changes his body mass to depict that. So how did that affect the, the shooting schedule, really, to, to encompass? Well, the thing that I said to Tom, because Hank was even much thinner than Tom is in the movie, and I said to Tom, I don't want you to, you know, to lose 40 pounds to do the movie. I don't believe in that. I mean, it's fine if you want to. It's not healthy, and also anyone can do that. That doesn't mean you're a great actor because you can lose 40 pounds. If I paid you enough money, you could, you'd could you lose 40 pounds. If I said, here's $2 million, go, you'd go, okay, fine. So that was... A, as a byproduct of the film, Tom did want to get thinner, and he did sort of he did make an effort, and he did run, and he did you know lose some weight. What we had to do is shoot some of those things early on, because we didn't have enough money to do the music all through the film. So we had to do the music scenes all in one pocket, Claire. So what we did is we shot all the music scenes in about a two and a half week period. And so everything revolved around that. So we had to sort, so we kind of got Tom to the point where he was, we started with some of the earlier stuff, the later stuff in the film was earlier in the film, then there was the singing, and then we got into some of the other meat. So like any film, you're always making decisions, whether it's about weather or time or actors availabilities, you're always juggling a schedule. You never shoot it unless maybe you have the revenant or you have enough money to shoot it like that, but that's a real rarity. And you talked about the weather there. Watching the film, the, the weather and the elements seem to be a really important part of this as well. When I felt transported into the film by the 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 the, the, the wind blowing and the, yeah. and the and the you know the, you can see the sweat and you can feel the heat. Was that something very important as a contrast to the? It music? was to me because I really think the film's an immersive experience, and I really one of the things that people very rarely write about and don't even notice is there's no score in this film. 
There's no score. You haven't seen 10 movies in your life without any score. And so the sounds of the cicadas, the crickets, the wind was important to me from a sound design standpoint. I also happen to have one of the great cinematographers in the world, Dante Spinotti, who shot most of Michael Mann's films, shot L.A. Confidential. He's a brilliant cinematographer. We're shooting the film. And Meredith Boswell's production designer has been nominated. So I had some great people. And so creating the ambiance that you're talking about, which was... I'm very aesthetically oriented, so I, I pay attention to everything, that, the way things look. And yes, I wanted to immerse people without it being kind of a uh, twee. I didn't want it to be, oh, it's so perfectly period, but I wanted you to feel that. And yes, I did. The light, everything was like that. So, you know, thanks for noticing that.